So this is going to be section two, chapter uh, night two of chapter 35 for the pediatrics. If you guys remember, I was telling you that this is going to be a long chapter, so we were going to break it up into two nights. So this will begin the second night of pediatrics. All right, so let's dive off into this. So we're going to talk about airway adjuncts. Um, airway adjuncts are devices, obviously, that what we can do to help secure the airway. Now, this is just to maintain it uh, until a, an advanced airway gets put in there. So we can use oropharyngeal or nasal pharyngeal airways. During these, we can also use bite blocks, bag valve masks to make sure we do proper ventilations in the process. Uh, so these devices are what's in our toolbox and we continue throughout the process to make it work. Um, so oropharyngeal airway. So this is also called an OPA, if you guys remember. So this is designed to keep the tongue from blocking the airway. It makes suction a whole lot easier. Should be used for pediatric patients who are unconscious and impossible respiratory failure. Um, so we wanna make sure we try to secure that airway as fast as we can. Um, while we're doing this, be cautious if you try to use this on a conscious patient that they may have a gag reflex because it's not it's just not going to work. Um, have to be cautious also if we put uh, try to use any type of airway adjunct, anybody that has ingested caustic or petroleum based products um, and has a reaction to the device itself. So it may not be able to sit properly. So those are just some minor things to remember. When we talk about OPAs. So on the NPA, uh, this is our sometimes usually tolerated. They're not comfortable to put in. Um, I can promise you I've done one multiple times on myself. It's not that I wanted to do it. It's because I had to do it for a job. Very, it's, it's, it's different, shall I say. Uh, you, use, you can use these also for responsive pediatric patients. Again, it is, it is tolerable. It is just uh, uncomfortable going down. Um, you use this in association with possible respiratory failure if you want to try to hold obtain that airway early. You want to provide bag valve mask in the early part of the stages. You can drop an uh, NPA down and use it that way. So it shows on your screen where you talk about rarely used for a, a younger than one years old. The, eh, we just don't have one that's small. We, we should just uh, be cautious of that. Um, and then as you see, we don't really want to use this on any type of uh, pediatric or adult if we see any type of nasal obstruction or head trauma, um, because we may potentially, uh, if they have a, you know, a deviated septum or the skull, the basal skull fracture, we could potentially cause some uh, issues there. Um, it's more on the head trauma part for the uh, basal or skull fracture that they're worried that in that one case in a million that it could result into being pushed up into the base of the brain. So keep that in mind um, as you go to use these devices, just uh, observe the area, observe inside the mouth, the nose, see if there's any type of skull fractures as you move forward. So some any potential problems, an airway with a small diameter may easily become obstructed by mucus, blood, vomit, uh, or soft some tissues in there. So if the airway is too long, it may stimulate the vagus nerve and allow the heart rate or enter the esophagus causing a gastric distension. Um, this may cause a spasm of the larynx and result in vomiting if inserted into, the, into a responsive patient. Keep that in mind, always have suction close. And then a nasal pharyngeal airway should not be used when pediatric patients have facial trauma because of the airway may tear some soft tissues and cause bleeding into the airway. So the oxygen delivery system. So let's talk about this. So in treating infants and children who require more than usual 21% of oxygen found in the room, you have several options here. Same thing with adults. Uh, it's just, we can use the same things. It's just in higher uh, concentrations. Oh, let's see here. Low by techniques, usually at six liters per minute, providing more than 21% of oxygen concentration. Nasal, con nasal cannula, it's uh, applied at one to six liters per minute. And that provides anywhere from 24 to 44% oxygen concentration. A non-rebreather mask at 10 to 15 can supply up to 95% oxygen concentration. And a bag, mouth, bag valve mask or bag mask device that is properly secured to the face at a 10 to 15 liters per minute rate can provide up to 100% of concentration of oxygen. 
The use of a non-rebreather mask, nasal cannula, or a simple face mask is indicated for or it is indicated only for pediatric patients who have adequate respirations and or tidal volume. Children with respiratory of fewer than 12 breaths a minute or more than 60 breaths a minute are altered level of consciousness. And or a inadequate tidal volume should receive assisted ventilation with a bag mask, uh, bag mask device. So we're gonna help them breathe. We're gonna put that on their face and assist them when they take deep breaths. We're going to uh, compress that bag and turn around and make it into a uh, just we're, or assisting them, like we said. So blow by method, just what it is when you, when you hear it. It is not nearly as effective as a face mask or a nasal cannula, but it does deliver oxygen in the right place. Uh, it does not provide high concentration of oxygen, but it's better than no oxygen at all. So we're just taking it and going by their face. If they're not able to tolerate any type of mask, due to some other situation that's going on at the same time, we have to try our best to get this oxygen delivered to them. So we're gonna turn around and use a blow-by mask. Uh, it's just, it's a, well, it's a blow-by procedure. It's not really a type of mask, but we're gonna turn around and uh, hold it close to their face to where the oxygen is delivering um, up around their nose where they're getting uh, able to breathe it in. We don't want to hold it around their chest area because it's just not going to work. We want to make sure to try to hold this as close as their face as they can. That is tolerable. Again, we're only doing this because they may not be able to tolerate any other type of face mask. Nasal cannulas. Some pediatric patients prefer nasal cannulas. Others find it very uncomfortable because they're not used to the little prongs that go up into their nose. So here's a little procedure right here. They're showing you um, that blow-by techniques and then the pediatric prongs. Um, so good little idea, um, gives you some pictures, show you some cool things, uh, gives you an idea of how these masks are used on these particular patients. non rebreather masks, they do deliver up to 90% of oxygen to the pediatric patient, and it allows them to exhale all carbon dioxide without rebreathing it because it has a one-way valve uh, attached on the side of the mask. Bag mask device is indicated for pediatric patients who have respirations that are either too slow or too fast, who are unresponsive or do not respond in a purposely way to painful stimuli. One person's mask, uh, one person bag mask ventilations on a pediatric patient. So as you see right here, they're showing you how to use a face mask on the left-hand side, showing you all just make sure that it seats well, and then on the right side, they're used in a, sorry, pediatric approved bag mask or bag valve mask. They're not trying to use an adult one. This was one specifically for pediatrics and it's rated at their particular weight. So those are done. Uh, we want to make sure that they have the right ones. Uh, we deliver the, the right uh, liters per minute. So those all help us out in the long run. Two person mask. Uh, ventilation on a pediatric patient. So this procedure is very similar to the one person mask, except that one rescuer holds the mask to the face and then the and, hang, and maintains a head position. The second one uh, uses the bag and they squeeze it when they're supposed to. This is more effective because it does help maintain a proper seal. But at the same time as we may not always have the extra resources, um, let's say if we're a first responder and we show up by ourselves, uh, those are the, some of the things that we have to be cautious about. Um, but the two-person mask uh, delivery system is more effective. Uh, cardi cardiac pulmonary arrest. So we know that children also go into uh, cardiac arrest. So most often associated with respiratory failure and or arrest. Children are affected differently than adults when it comes to decreased oxygen saturation. So Focuses should be on effective CPR, early use of an ED, and then transport. So the faster that we can get CPR to them, the faster that we can get an AED there, the better off that we are, and then faster transportation to the local emergency department is what we want. And I should have said AED, not ED. I'm sorry, guys. Circularization, uh, so let's talk about some shock. All right, so shock develops when the circulatory system is unable to deliver a significant 
amount of blood to the organs of the body. So we have issues there. So this does result in eventually cardiac pulmonary arrest. Uh, this compensated shock is in the early stage of shock when the body can still compensate for the blood loss. So the body's working, trying to keep that from happening. What we go into decompensated shock is the later stage of shock when the blood pressure is failing. So it's, it's, it's dropping so fast because of the rate of blood loss and the heart is pumping. It gets to where it just dry pumps. There's nothing there for it to pump and it just vapor locks with a kind of like an oxygen, uh, let's say it gets air in the line and, right, the, right, and the heart cannot just pump that. So we know those things. So that's the ultimately end, end stage for a child. Um, in pediatric patients, the most common cause of shock is trauma injury with blood loss. Boom, we just talked about that. Dehydration from diarrhea or vomiting, severe infection and a neurologic injury. So dehydration is super important. That's why we always try to harp on our kids uh, when they're sick. They got to drink something. We got to put fluids in them because we don't need them to get dehydrated because they can eventually go into shock because their body has no way to work with these items and there's nothing there for them to work with. So we, we got to keep them hydrated the best we can. A severe allergic reaction of anaphylaxis to an allergen. Um, we talk about the disease of the heart, tension pneumothorax. Uh, we have blood around the heart. As you can see, you talk about a cardiac tamponade and perchitis. This is the same thing that adults have. It can happen in children. Um, it, it's it's going to be found, unfortunately, sooner because there's not a lot to work with. And we have to be cautious with these babies because if any massive change of blood loss that they're, we're, we're concerned about uh, severe damaging CPR where they go under uh, cardiac arrest, shock, uh, and then ultimately the, the worst case is death. So pediatric patients respond differently than adults to fluid loss because there's not as much. Uh, they may respond by increasing their heart rate, increasing respirations and showing signs of pale or blue skin. So we see these signs of shock earlier than we do in adults because they don't carry around as much uh, blood as we do as an adult. So that's a concern that we have to do when we know and we see a lot of bleeding on children, we need to say, how long have they been bleeding like this? Because that limits our abilities and times in the field to where we have to turn around and get them to emergency department as fast as possible. Signs of shock in children are as follows. We talk about tachycardia. We talk about poor capillary refill, uh, less than two seconds. So tachycardia, if you guys remember, that is higher heart rate than a normal person should have on an average. So children have a range of uh, tachycardia too. When you start getting there, uh, hopefully you guys will advance on into the advanced class and you can talk more about uh, rates and rhythms um, and recognizing them and what they look like. But um, for right now, we just say that it's a higher heart rate to stay into the 100s. That's going to be considered to tachycardia. You're going to notice some types of mental status change in these children uh, due to the blood loss. They are unable to, their brain's unable to function right. Um, being uh, treating shock by assessing the ABCs, intervention as required. If there is an obvious life-threatening external hemorrhage, uh, the order becomes CAB uh, because a bleeding control is the most critical step at this point. A cardiac arrest is suspected and the order also becomes CAB because the chest compressions are essential. Pediatric patients in shock often have increased respirations but do not dis Discriminate, word sounded crazy to me, a fall in blood pressure until shock is super severe because they're compensating for that. Limit your management to these simple interventions. So I want you to keep it simple, uh, the, the KISS method. The KISS method is keep it simple, stupid. Uh, ensure the airway is open, prepare for artificial ventilations, control bleeding, and give supplemental oxygen by blow by mask. Keep them very warm, provide rapid transport to the nearest appropriate facility, and contact ALS uh, backup if needed, if it's considered to be a long transport. So keep your skills and your abilities very simple. We want you to make it uh, the best and transport as fast as possible because that's what that child needs. They need an uh, advanced level of care, and they need an emergency department doctor, you know, surgeon, something like that that's a little bit more uh, trained than we are. So we talk about uh, 
some other managements here. We're going to give supplemental oxygen, continue to monitor the airway during transport, position the patient, position comfort the best that we can, keep them warm again and with the heat on. Provide immediate transport, call for vents back up. All right, so anaphylaxis. What is anaphylaxis? Well, anaphylaxis is also called anaphylactic shock. Uh, that is a reaction to something. It is a life-threatening allergic reaction that involves generalized multi-system response to an antigen. So it's getting stung by a wasp. They will have an allergic reaction to that. This is characterized by an airway swelling and dilation of the blood vessels. Uh, common causes are insect stings, medications, and or food allergies. You know, a lot more of the peanut allergies in this world. Uh, my daughter is no longer allowed to bring outside food unless it's approved to a classroom event because of all the allergies that's within the school. It's, it's crazy. It's, we've seen a lot, a lot more of these um, food allergies that we're not aware of. The signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis shock is hyperfusion, hypo, per, hypoperfusion, uh, strider and wheezing, increased workload of breathing, an altered appearance with restlessness, agitation, and sometimes a sense of impending doom. Uh, you talk about hives. Uh, we'll talk about how to treat these. The biggest thing is, is we want to maintain their, their airway. Make sure that we can keep it open. If we realize that that's an issue, we're going to turn around and need to put an advanced airway in as fast as we possible. Well, an OPA or NPA is something that we need to do in the, in the fast time. Maintain the airway or oxygen administration. Keep the patient as calm as possible. Assist the parent with administration of prescribed epi auto injector. If they don't have one, we can't give them one that's not theirs. You, we are not able to prescribe medication as EMT basis. So remember, if you dig in your bag and give them yours, you could be held potentially in trouble because that's, that's prescribing medications and we don't do that. So here's another ac uh, an acronym that you can use. We talk about AEIO and U and TIPS. Um, let's see, an abnormal neurologic, neurologic state in which the pediatric patient is less heart and interactive than the age appropriate. Understanding normal development or age-related characteristics, changes in behavior and listening carefully to the caregiver's opinions are the key. The mnemonic AEIO and TIPS reflect the major cause of AIMS. Um, that's altered mental status. A second for let y'all write that down. Signs and symptoms vary from simple confusion to a coma. We know that the management, again, is really going to be situated to ABCs or CAB because if we can't fix that, these babies are going to go into shock and ultimately into cardiac arrest. Fast. So the faster that we can recognize their ABC needs and fix them, the better off our, outs our management can be for this child. Some seizures. So unfortunately, seizures happen a lot in children. Uh, this is a result of a disorganized electrical activity in the brain. Uh, this may manifest into a variety of ways depending on the age of the child. Seizures in infants can be very subtle, consisting only of abnormal goals gaze, sorry, abnormal gaze, sucking motions, or bicycling motions. In older children, seizures are more obvious and typically consist of repetitive muscle contractions and unresponsiveness. So here are some common causes of seizures. Uh, we do see these in uh, child abuse, unfortunately. Uh, Electrolyte imbalance, fever is probably one of the biggest one. Uh, medication, poisoning, seizure disorder. Uh, parents having recreational drug use and head trauma. Uh, some are unable to be determined why they are seizing. So that's why they can put no cause found on them. Once a seizure stops, the patient's muscle relax, becoming almost flaccid or floppy, and the breathing becomes labored. This is called the postictal state. Um, you can see these a lot. A lot of times you may not see them actively seizing but we will see them in the post-stictal state once we arrive. Once the, patient, the pediatric patient regains a normal level of consciousness, the post-stictal state is over. That is a phase between actively seizing, post-seizing, 
and then coming back to normal. So we call that the postictal state. Seizures that continue every few minutes with regaining con without regaining consciousness in between or last longer than 30 minutes are referred to as a status epilepticus. Reoccurring or prolonged seizures should be considered potential life-threatening. If the patient does not regain consciousness or continues to seize, protect the patient from harming him or herself and call for ALS backup. Never, ever, 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 ever hold these patients down. Don't ever put something in their mouths. Um, they have incredibly and strong strength, so be very cautious about putting anything near or around their mouths. Keep your hands and objects clear of that area during these seizures. Um, be prepared to secure an airway. Um, and then if they happen to seize again post uh, you securing the airway, they could potentially break that device. So be smart about when you put something in somebody's mouth. It is, it's very cautious, specifically if they're seizing, you, you need to be prepared for anything. Um, secure and protect the airway is our priority. Place the child in a recovery position if vomiting and suction is adequate. It's inadequate. Um, always clear the mouth with the suction device. Uh, never a finger, a hand, or a tool. Um, be prepared for uh, the patient to have incontinence where they use the restroom on themselves. We always want to provide 100% of oxygen by a non rebreather mask or a blow by method. Uh, beginning back valve mask ventilations if there are no signs of improvement. We want to force that air in their body. We don't want to just give a blow by. We want to make sure that we ventilate for them and we're forcing that air into them by the back valve mask. Some caregivers will, will have a child, uh, some caregivers will have given the child a rectal dose of diazepam, uh, which is Dastat, uh, prior to your arrival. Monitor breathing and level consciousness if they're able to respond. Um, a lot of times the uh, children, pediatrics do more than likely have rectal doses. Um, and it is sometimes it's not out of our protocols to get orders for that. If you're unable to obtain an IV as a paramedic or an advanced, they will give potentially orders for that. It's something that we just have to make up in the truck and transport the patients appropriately to the correct facility that's ready for them. So we talk about meningitis a little bit. Uh, if you don't know, this is the inflammation of the tissue that covers the spinal cord and goes into the brain. Uh, being able to recognize a pediatric patient with meningitis, meningitis is very, very, very important. All right, so meningitis. Um, and individuals are at greater risk are males, newborn infants, and children with compromised immune uh, systems from age or cancer. Children who have any history of brain, spinal cord, or back surgeries. Children who have had head trauma in the past. Children with shunts, pins, or other foreign bodies within their brain or spinal cord are at a higher risk of meningitis than anybody else. Signs and symptoms of meningitis vary depending on the, child's, uh, the patient's age. Fever and altered level of consciousness are commonly, common symptoms for anybody of that age. Children may also experience a seizure, which may be the first sign of meningitis. Uh, infants younger than two to three months old can have acne, cyanosis, fever, a, dist a distinct high-pitched cry, or hypothermia. Meningeal irritation are meningeal signs, are terms used by the doctors to describe the pain that accompanies the movement. Uh, often the results in the characteristic of a stiff neck. Uh, one sign of meningitis in an infant is increased irritability and bulging fontanelle without crying. So their, their heads are going to be a little bit swollen. It's going to look like fever uh, water on the brain, just in their fontanelle area. So, um, Neisseria men, uh, meningitis is a bacteria that causes a rapid onset of meningitis syndrome. Uh, Symptoms often leading to shock or death. Uh, children with N meningitis typically have small pinpoint cherry red spots or a larger purple to black rash on their face and body. So here's a picture. We talk about the feet. 
Um, this is more of an elderly patient. I can tell you that because of how flat the feet are already in life. Um, that is not a child, but the elderly can also get the same issues. So all pediatric patients with suspected meningitis should be considered very, very, very contagious. Follow standard precautions when dealing with pediatric patients with possible meningitis and follow up to learn the patient's diagnosis. If exposed to saliva or respiratory secretions, you should receive antibiotics. Treatment of child with suspected meningitis, provide a supplemental oxygen and assist with ventilations if need so. Reassess vital signs frequency during transport to the highest level of service available. They need to go to a specialized hospital, not just your regular Band-Aid station. If you recognize that, or you see that stiff neck, or they've traveled outside the country recently, that's one of those that probably needs to go to your trauma center. Now, if you don't have a trauma center in your local immediate area, that may be something that you can coordinate air transport or have some other ALS uh, assistance in this long transport. All right, so poisoning. So poisoning is a common among children. They put every single thing that's close to them in their mouth. This can occur by ingestion, inhaling, injection, or absorbing any toxic substance. Uh, some of your common sources of poisoning in children are in your book on table 3513. All right, so we'll talk about uh, some common sources are alcohol, aspirins or acetaminophen, cosmetics, household cleaning products such as bleach or furniture polish, some particular house plants, some iron, prescription medications. We'll talk about the good old illicit street drugs and an overdose of medication, of vitamins, sorry. Signs and symptoms of poisoning uh, vary widely depending on the substance, the age of the child, the weight of the child, um, if there's any type of combination. The patient may appear normal at first or may be confused, they may be sleepy or uh, complete unconscious. If some substances, uh, sorry, some substances only take at least one pill to be a lethal in small children, so understanding what they took and how long they took is very vital in our response to a child poisoning. Infants may be poisoned as a result of being fed harmful substances by a sibling, parent, or caregiver. Many may be exposed in a setting in which harmful substances are smoked. After you have completed your primary assessment, ask the patient or caregiver to answer some of your following questions. What is the substance that is involved? Approximately how much of the substance was ingested or involved in the exposure? What time did this happen? Are there any changes in behavior or level of consciousness? Was there any cooking or cough, sorry, choking or coughing after this particular exposure? You like that cooking, choking. Ooh, my brain didn't recognize that word. Contact poison control uh, for assistance in identifying the, the poisons. Treatment of potential pediatric patients, perform an external decontamination, assess, the assess and maintain ABCs and monitor breathing, provide oxygen and perform ventilations if necessary. So we're going to provide a back valve mask if they need it. If a child demonstrates signs of shock, position supine, keep the victim, keep the child warm, and transport very promptly. In some of these cases, you can give activated charcoal. That is dependent upon uh, what our med control says. Um, it may be in your standard protocols, but it is still good in a particular case like this to reach out to med control for some guidance and assistance to make sure that you're correct. Dehydration emergencies. Uh, dehydration occurs when fluid loss are greater than fluid intake. Vomiting and diarrhea are the most common causes of dehydration, same thing for adults. If left untreated, dehydration can lead to shock and death. Infants and children are at greater risk than adults for dehydration because their fluid reserves are smaller than ours as adults, like everything else. Life-threatening dehydration can overcome an infant in a matter of just hours. Dehydration and mild dehydration are severe refer to table 3514 in your book 
So you can kind of understand a little bit better looking at a chart. Signs of mild dehydration. You have your dry lips, gums, decreased saliva, few wet diapers. You have signs of moderate dehydration or sunken eyes, sleeplessness, irritability, and sunken front nails. Signs of dehydration are molted, cool, clammy skin, delayed capillary response times, and increased respirations. Here's a picture that makes it pretty obvious. Uh, assess ABCs and obtain a baseline vitals. If dehydration is severe, ask for ALS backup so they can start a line early. Uh, all patients with moderate to severe dehydration should be transported. And you see the picture. An infant with dehydration it may exhibit tinting or poor skin torture. Uh, so you see there's a lot of bagginess skin there because it's sucking all the water out and it's just holding it in place because it's upon the body. For uh, fever, an increase in body temperature usually responses to an infection. Uh, temperatures at 100.4 or higher are considered abnormal. Fever is rarely life-threatening, but fever with a rash can be a serious sign such as meningitis. So some common causes of fever in these pediatric patients are infections, status epilepticus, cancer, drug injections, arthritis and systemic lupus. Uh, uh, it's a rash across the nose, just in case y'all were wondering. So it is high environmental temperatures. Fever is the result of an internal body mechanism in which heat generation is increased and heat loss is decreased. An accurate body temperature is vital for signs of pediatric uh, for pediatric patients. A rectal temperature is the most accurate for infants and toddlers. That is something that is not taught a whole lot into EMS. It is not pounded in our head because we don't really think about those, but that is the best way to get a temperature is by rectal. Uh, you can use the, the probes as long as there's a cover on there to comfort that and the parent or, or caregiver may already have that to where you can use your, theirs. All right, so depending on the source of the infection, the pediatric patient may present with signs of respiratory stress, such as a stiff neck, a rash, skin that is hot to the touch, flushed cheeks, seizures, and infants, uh, bulging font nails. I wanna make sure I'm still on the same screen. Okay, cool deal. Sorry, I didn't have the highlight marker on my screen. I couldn't make sure. So you wanna assess the patient for other signs and symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, decreased feedings, and headaches. Now, obviously if it is vomiting or diarrhea, you're probably gonna see that and or potentially unfortunately smell it. So that being the case, that may not be something that is super worryful, but we can uh, pay attention to that. Provide rapid transport and manage the patient's ABCs. Uh, follow standard precautions if you suspect the patient may have a communicable disease. Um, it is always important nowadays, period, to just wear your gloves, your eye protection, and have a mask handy. And when we talk about masks, we want to make sure it's the appropriate mask for the potential exposure. I, I, people used to always make fun of me, but on the truck, I always wore a fanny pack anytime I got out because it always carried an extra set of gloves and at least two types of mask. Um, I tried my best to always have that on me because I don't want to bring anything home with me. And it is my job to provide a high level of care, but at the same time as I, I just wanna be safe myself. So that's something to keep in, hand, in, in mind. So febrile seizures, common in children between the ages of six months and six years. Most pediatric seizures are the result of fever alone, which is why they are called febrile seizures. This typically occurs on the first day of febrile seizures of illnesses. This is characterized by generalized tonic-clonic seizure activity. They do last a little bit uh, less than 15 minutes with little or no palpitatal state. It's like they seize and then they turn around and come right back out of it. This may be a sign of more serious problems such as meningitis. ABCs uh, provide cooling measures with 
uh, tepid water to provide prompt transport. All patients with febrile seizures need uh, to be seen in the hospital settings. And the old wives tale um, is uh, use a little bit of alcohol, not saying that that's something bad, but that is not a medical uh, procedure that we can do. So for drowning emergencies, so always take steps to ensure your own safety first. Make sure you look at the scene and understand what's going on. Second most common cause of unintentional deaths among children, one to four years old in the, in the United States is drowning. Children often fall into swimming pools, lakes, uh, but may not drown in bathtubs, even puddles or buckets of water. Uh, older adolescents drownings when swimming or boating, alcohol is frequently a factor. Uh, principal conditions that result from drowning is a lack of oxygen. Obviously, it's an overload of water. Uh, principal, let's see here, even a few minutes without oxygen affects the heart and lungs and brain. Submersion in icy water can lead to hypothermia. Diving into water is an increased risk of spinal cord injury, so understand that too. Be prepared to see spine and always take a backboard with you. Sign and symptoms based on the are very dependent on the base and type of length of submersion. Pediatric patient may be presenting with a cough, choking, airway obstruction, difficulty breathing, AMS, seizure activity, unresponsiveness, fast or slow or no pulse, pale, cyanotic skin, and abnormal distension. That would be abdominal. Wow. That was. Sorry, y'all. That was bad on me. Advantage of these drowning emergencies, always, always, always request ALS. They need an ALS intervention ASAP. Assess and manage the ABCs. Administer oxygen via non-rebreather mask or back valve mask device if associated ventilations are required. Have such suction ready. If a trauma is suspected, apply a cervical collar and place the patient on a backboard. Catch your trauma emergencies and, man and management. So our unintentional injuries are the number one killer of children in the US. Quality care in the first few minutes after the child has been injured can have an enormous impact on that child's chances for complete recovery. The muscles and bones of children continue to grow as well into adolescents. Adolescents are prone to fractures of extremities, <laughs> very much so. A fracture of the femur is rare in pediatric patients, but when it does occur, it is a source of major blood loss. Older children and adolescents are prone to uh, long bone fractures, which is going to be included in our femurs and humors, because they tend to have, uh, because they tend to take more risk during physical activities. They think they're six foot tall and bulletproof. Um, children's bones are soft tissues as well, developing than those of, uh, they do develop those, than those of an adult, and therefore the force of an injury affects the structures differently. Because a child's head is proportionally larger than the adult's, it exerts greater stress on the neck structures during a deceleration injury. Psychological differences. Children are often injured because of their undeveloped judgment and their lack of experience. Always assume the child has a serious head injury or neck injury until proven otherwise. A common, uh, for head injuries, common are common in children because of the size of the child's head in relation to the body is larger than that of an adult. An infant also has a softer, thinner skull, which may result in an injury to the brain's tissues. The scalp and facial vessels can bleed very easily and may cause a great deal of blood loss if not controlled. Nausea and vomiting are common signs of symptoms of a head injury for children and, and adults too, so uh, don't just think it's a child thing. Mobilization is necessary for children who have possible head or spinal injuries after a traumatic event. It can be difficult because of the child's body proportions. Um, you can see in your book on 35-6, the steps to immobilize a pediatric patient in a car seat. That's very, very handy. And chest injuries usually result of blunt rather than penetrating trauma. Chest wall is flexible in children and can produce a flail chest. 
Although there may be no external signs of injury, there may be significant injuries within the chest. So consider uh, airway uh, obstruction. You're going to have a possible airway uh, collapse. Uh, hemoneumothorax, either one of those could have both and or a flailed chest, like they said. So some common injuries in children uh, or abdominal injuries. Uh, monitor for signs and symptoms of shock, this including a weak, rapid pulse, cold, clammy skin, decreased capillary refill, confusion, and decreased systolic blood pressure. If the patient shows signs and symptoms of a shock, prevent hypothermia by keeping the patient warm with blankets. If the patient has a bradycardia, ventilate them. Monitor during transport. The figure on the slide illustrates the impact of blood loss on the potential for developing shock. All children with abdominal injuries should be monitored closely for signs and symptoms of shock. So you can see right there. Abdominal injury versus this guy has a broken tib fib, uh, looks like a femur fracture, and maybe some abdominal injuries too. I can't tell if his pelvis is fractured by that, that picture or not. So you can see the child has a highly 25% a greater uh, loss and significantly increased risk of shock because of the volume ratio there. All right, on burns, we'd be more, serious, or more concerned about burns in children. They are generally considered more serious than an adult. Infants and children have more surface area related to the total body mass, which means greater fluid and heat loss. Children are also more likely to go into shock, developing hypothermia, and experience airway problems. The most common ways in children are burned. So exposure to hot substances, such as scalding water in the bathtub, hide items on a stove, they reach up and grab it. Unfortunately, they're at that level. Exposure to caustic substances, such as cleaning solvents or paint thinners. Older children, older children are more likely to be burned by flames from a fire. Infection is a common problem following a burn and any injury to a child. Uh, sterile techniques should be used in handling the skin of a child with a burn, if possible. Consider the possibility of child abuse on any burn situation in a child. Make sure you report any information about suspicious to the appropriate authorities. Uh, minor partial thickness burns involve less than 10% of the body surface. Moderate partial thickness burns involving 10% to 20% of the body surface. And severe is any full thickness burn, a partial thickness burn involving more than 20% of body surface or any burn involving the head, feet, face, airway, or genitalia. Pediatric patients are managed in the same way as adults. We wanna potentially uh, keep them from going into shock. If a patient shows bradycardia, ventilate them. And again, transport this patient and monitor them during transportation. Children having immature bones uh, with, uh, with acti active growth plates. The growth of long bones occur from the ends at specialized growth plates. Growth plates are potential weak spots. Uh, I've seen many, many uh, growth plates broken and are fractured, and it has stunt or uh, stop the growth of that particular uh, bone. Um, you can have an incomplete or a green stick fracture. If you want, you can look at those pictures. Those are kind of cool. You can see those green stick fractures. It's, it's, I think they're neat. Y'all may not like those pictures at all. So generally, extremity injuries in children are managed in the same way as those of adults. They are painful. Uh, once the kid sees them, it becomes a lot more, I think that's happens to all of us. So once we see it, it becomes way more painful to all of us. So uh, the best thing that I try to like to do, if I'm there pretty quick, uh, and let's say another uh, parent or somebody else is not allowing the child to see it, I don't let them see it either. They're, they're a little bit more calmer if they can't see it. So I try my best not to let them see it until it's all bandaged and stabilized. So pain management, the first step is to and pain management is to recognize that the patient is in pain. <laughs> Obviously, when they're screaming, hollering, fussing, we, we get that. 
Some uh, pediatric patients will be nonverbal or have limited vocabulary. Look for visual clues uh, and use the Wong Baker face pain scale. That's the little smiley faces. Um, you are limited uh, to following the pain interventions. You can position it. You can use ice packs or extremity elevation. That's all you can do as a basic. These interventions will decrease the pain and swelling to the injury site. Additional ALS interventions may be needed because they carry the good stuff. Another important tool is kindness and providing emotional support. That's, that's the big tool right there too. All right, so the Jumpstart Triage System was developed for pediatric patients specifically. This is intended for patients younger than eight who appear to weigh less than 100 pounds or 45 pounds, uh, 45 kilograms. There are four uh, triage categories in the Jumpstart system. This is designated by colors responding to the different levels of urgency. This is kind of the color system that has been adapted across the world. Greens are walking wounded or greens are good to go. Yellows are, I'm hurt, I can still move. They do have some urgency to leave. Reds are emergency, must go now. Uh, if delayed, they will pass. And black is obviously the deceased. Uh, so here, we'll break them down a little bit better for you. So the green ones, they are able to walk. Obviously, the infants can't. Um, green tags is minor. It is not needed for immediate treatment. The presence of spontaneous breathing with a pulse, a peripheral pulse, and appropriate responses to pain stimuli is tagged yellow and you can delay treatment to them. Um, area uh, apnea response to position or rescue breathing, respiratory failure, breathing but without a pulse or inappropriate painful response. Those are red tagged for immediate transport. Apnea and without a pulse or apnea and unresponsive to breathing is a black tag considered deceased or expectant de deceased. Understand that triage should take you less than a minute to do this. Now, granted, if you show up to a multi-casualty scene, it's gonna take you a little bit longer. But remember, if you do anything to a patient, let's say you reposition the headway, the airway, and they quit breathing again. Now you have started treatment to this patient and you must stay with them. It is very, very hard to triage your career because everybody wants to be saved. You want to save every single body out there because it's your job, you're ready to go, but we can't. Um, unfortunately, I've been in many, many uh, instances where I've had to triage patients and I've had to list some children even in the black category. It is not what I want to do. I always want to make sure that I can treat my patients and make sure that they go on to see a better day but there is just some times in our career that we can't do those things. Be cautious about that. Um, it is very traumatic at the same point to us as caregivers. Um, so if that's something you're faced with in your career early, I highly recommend that you go speak to somebody and get that out. Um, it is not something that we enjoy to do as part of our career is triage, but it is a needed tool. I recommend that somebody older, uh, that is more seasoned into the EMS, that does the triage because you, you get more seasoned, you get a little bit harder, you, you recognize uh, things and you've, you've kind of dealt with things as you've come into your career. So triage is difficult for the new EMS providers. Maybe something you're gonna have to do one day, but just understand that it's rough. So here's a screen that's kind of a little uh, triage, check yes or no boxes if they have issues that it helps you with triaging patients. Um, I like this one. I think it's really good. I think it's educational. Um, so when you, if you can, I would print this free screen uh, whatever you need to do to kind of put it in your little go bag, your memory book, uh, the tools helps you build just a, a good toolbox with information of things that you can help with.
So child abuse and neglect. The child abuse means at any proper or excessive, excessive action that injures or otherwise harms a child or infant. This includes physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, and emotional abuse. Over half a million children are victims of child abuse annually. Many of these children suffer life-threatening injuries and some die. If you suspect child abuse, if suspected child abuse is not reported, the abuse is likely to happen again, perhaps causing permanent injury or even death. That's something that is required is any type of abuse, uh, children, uh, elderly, that has to be reported um, to a law enforcement or to a supervisor ASAP. Child abuse occurs in every socioeconomic status, so you must be aware of the patient's surroundings and document your findings objectively. Don't put emotions in there. You may be called to testify in abuse cases. It is essential to record all findings, including any statements made by caregivers or others on the scene. Ask yourself these following questions, as you see on the screen right there. Uh, is the MOI reported consistent with the injury? Is the injury typically for development level of children? Is there evidence of drinking or drugs used at the scene? Is there a good relationship between the caregiver and the child? Obviously, I skipped a few, but those are pretty good to, uh, questions to ask, to think about when you're looking at these injuries. Is that something I should see in a, like a three-year-old, you know, something like that with, that potentially could affect our uh, thought process? Does the child have multiple injuries at different stages of healing? So you see different bruises, uh, different colorations of bruising is a sign. Does the child have several types of injuries? Um, does the child have unusual marks or bruises that may be caused by cigarette, heating grates, or branding injuries? Those will make you get very aggravated, I can promise you. Is the child clean and appropriate weight for his or her age? What does the home look like? Is it clean or dirty? Is it warm or cold? And is there food there? Here's a little mnemonic again. So the mnemonic child abuse may help you remember these points to look for. Bruises, observe the color and locations of any bruises. Bruises to the back, buttocks, or face are suspicious and are usually inflicted by a person. Now, I can tell you, when I was younger, if y'all would have seen me, man, y'all would have thought I was beat all the time. I was so bruised up. I played hard every day. Um, I'm sure some people thought that, but it was one of those, like, I, I worked hard. I mean, I was, I was always coming up with bruises and cuts and all that. I was getting into crap I probably should have never gotten to. Thank God my mom and daddy never found out. But, so look for these. Think about how active is the child? Are they, are they passive? Are they very quiet? Or is the caregiver speaking for them? Um, are they very defensive on letting that child go away from them and uh, not letting them get out of their sights? That's another thing for child abuse. And if the child's just very, uh, so what I found out in, in career, if a child's been sexually assaulted, most of the time, over time, these children are overly friendly because that's what they're told and it's watched in their brain. Um, so if you have one that's willing to come to you, sit in your lap and talk to you, that's, that's not normal for a child to come up to a stranger and speak to them and you not know what's going on um, and them not knowing you too. So keep those things in your mind also if you go somewhere and it's like, why is this child like overly, you know, like, talkative and sweet and just like what, what what's, what's the deal so think about that too so burns to the penis testicles vagina or buttocks are usually inflicted by someone else i pray so burns that encircle a hand or foot to look like a glove are usually inflicted by another person suspect abuse if the child has cigarette burns or grid pattern burns Fractures of the humerus or femur do not normally occur without some major trauma. Falls from a bed are usually not associated with fractures either. Maintain an index of suspicion if an infant or young child sustains a femur fracture 
or a complete bone fracture of any kind. Now, it, is, it takes a lot of pressure to break your femur bone. It takes a lot of, uh, of, of force to cause that. So knowing those things, if you see those in those young children, that is not something that normally occurs. So your, your spider senses should be going off and saying like, hey, this is not right. Something's up. Uh, we need to make some notes of this. We, we just need to check ourselves. So definitely document that too. Um, in the shaken baby syndrome, so infants may sustain a life-threatening head trauma uh, by being shaken or struck in the head. There is bleeding with this head and damage to the cervical spine resulting from the forceful shaking. You may notice um, raccoon eyes bleeding around the eyes uh, to where it looks like they've been punched in the eye. You know, fontanelle uh, issues, there may have some swelling to the head. Uh, look for the bruising around the back side of the ears too. You may notice some substance leaking from the ears. Um, be cautious of that. Uh, that may be also from a shaken baby syndrome. Neglect is a failure or refu a refusal or failure on the part of the caregiver to provide life necessities. Children who are neglected are often dirty, too thin, or appear de developmentally challenged uh, because of the lack of stimulation they've received. Abused children may appear to withdraw, fearful or hostile. They, they will be concerned if a child does not want to discuss how the injuries occur because it's they they don't. They know that something happened that shouldn't have happened. Occasionally, the parent or caregiver will reveal a history of accidents, be alert for conflicting stories or a lack of concern from the caregiver. The abuser may be a parent, caregiver, relative, or friend of the family. Again, EMTs in all states must report all suspected abuse. Most states have special forms to do so. Supervisors are generally forbidden from to interfere with reporting of a suspected abuse. Law enforcement and children protective service, child protective services will determine whether there is abuse or not. We, we can, we just report it. All right, so sexual abuse. Children of any age or gender can be victims of sexual abuse. Maintain an index of suspicion regardless of the patient's social or economic situation. An assessment should be limited to determine the type of Dressing any injury requires. Treatment of any bruises or fractures as well. Do not examine the genitalia of a young child unless there is evidence of bleeding or there is any injury to that particular area that needs to be addressed. Don't just go up there and start looking. That could be also accused of you sexually assaulting a patient. Do not allow the child to wash, urinate, or defecate before the physician completes a physical exam. Ensure that an EMT or police officer of the same gender remains with the child unless locating one will delay transportation. Maintain a very professional composure this entire time. Obtain as much information as possible from the child and any witnesses. Transport the child who are victims of sexual assault, obviously, and sexual abuse is a crime. I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with that, but that needs to be maintained and said that that is a crime and should be punished. Sudden unexpected uh, SIDS. Uh, the sudden unexpected infant death syndrome refers to a sudden unexpected death where the cause is not known until an investigation is concluded. One of the causes of a SUD is sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, which results in the death that cannot be explained by another cause. About 35,000 infants die of SIDS annually. That's very traumatic. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that a baby be placed on his back, his or her back, on a firm mattress in a crib that is free of bumpers, blankets, and toys. The CDC recommends having the baby sleep in the same room, but not in the same bed, chair, or sofa as an adult. Breastfeeding and use of a pacifier are associated with a lower risk of SIDS. Though it is impossible to predict any type of SIDS, a monitor mother younger than the age of 20, mother who smoked during pregnancy, 
a mother used alcohol or illicit drugs during pregnancy after birth or after birth, low birth weight, death as a result of SIDS can occur at any time uh, you will face with these three tasks, assessment of the scene, assessment and management of the patient, communication and support of the family. Talked about that one. Patients with uh, assessment and management and an infant who has been a victim of SIDS will be pale or blue, not breathing and unresponsive. Another cause, uh, over, uh, other causes included overwhelming infection, child abuse, airway obstruction, meningitis, um, accidental or intentional poisoning, hypoglycemia, which obviously we know that should be low, blood, low uh, glucose levels, congenital metabolic defects, and begin your assessment with the ABCs, providing interventions as necessary. Depending on how much time has passed, the child uh, may show signs of postmortem changes, including the child shows signs uh, called med control. If there is no signs of postmortem changes, begin CPR immediately. Pay special attention to the marks or bruises of the child before performing any procedures. Note any intervention that was done before you arrived, if any interventions. Carefully inspect the environment, nothing to, nothing, noting the condition of the scene where the infant was found. Assessment of the scene should concentrate on the following signs of illness, general condition of the house, signs of poor hygiene, family interaction, and the site where the infant was discovered. Communication with the family, the sudden death of an infant is a devastating event for the entire family. This tends to evoke strong emotional response among healthcare providers and allow the family to express their grief. Keep your guard up though. Offer the family a high level of empathy uh, and understanding. The family may want you to initiate resuscitation efforts, which may or may not conflict with your EMS protocols. Always introduce yourself to the, to the child's parents or caregiver and ask about the child's date of birth and medical history. Do not speculate on the scene uh, on the cause of the children's death. The family should be asked whether they want to hold the child and say goodbye. The following interventions are helpful. Learn to use the child's name rather than impersonal your child. Speak to the family members at eye level and maintain good eye contact with them. Use the word dead or died when informing the family of the child's death. Uh, Empathists such as passed away or gone or unaffected. They don't, they really don't like those. Um, I'm not a fan of using death or dying. I like, personally, I like to use as past and they're no longer with us. Um, it depends on, it depends on the people too. I mean, those are, you have to talk to your, your customers the way that fits them. A knowledge of the family's feelings, but never say, I know how you feel. Even if you experience a similar event, this statement won't anger many people. Offer to call the family members or clergy, uh, which is a minister, if the family wishes. Keep any instructions short, simple, and basic. Ask each adult family member individually whether he or she wants to hold the child. Wrap the dead child in a blanket and stay with the family member while they hold the child. Ask them not to remove tubes or other equipment which was used in the attempt of resuscitation. That is a crime scene, unfortunately. Each individual and each culture expresses grief in a different way. Some will require interventions. Most caregivers feel directly responsible for the death of the child. Some EMS systems arrange for home visits after the child's death so that EMS providers and family members can come to sort of conclusion. You need special trainings for such visits. I highly say that that's not in our, our scope of practice. That is not what we should do. Uh, that's that's a little bit more than care than what we should do. A child's death would be very stressful. Take the time before going back to the job. Talk with other EMS colleagues. Be alert for signs of post-traumatic stress in yourself and others. And consider the need for, for, for professional help if signs occur. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last part of your section two for the pediatric emergencies. Here is your class code. 
N8 plus GK. These are all in capital letters. Good luck on your test. Y'all have a fantastic evening, and I will see y'all on the next class for Thursday night. Thank y'all so much.